Live from San Francisco, extracting the signal from the noise. It's the Cube, covering Console Connect Live 2015. Sponsored by Console. Here's your host, John Furrier. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are live in San Francisco for special CUBE coverage from SiliconANGLE Media. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE. Joining my co-host Jeff Frick, general manager of the CUBE. We are live at Console Connect 2015, and our next guest is Randy Brockman, CEO of Edge Connects, fastest growing data center now, 23 and growing. Welcome to the CUBE. Thank you very much, pleasure to be here. Yeah, I love that stat, fastest growing data center. I thought data centers were supposed to be shrinking and getting <laughs> built in Alaska, Arizona, Iowa, farmland. Couldn't, name, mean, a, couldn't name better spots. Um, good uh, spots, uh, Probably fastest sun. growing <laughs> data center, plural. Uh, you, you hit the nail on the head. We are, uh, we've knocked out 23 data centers in the last 23 months. Uh, these are data centers we've built, not bought for the most part. Um, and you hit on the very markets. Uh, you hit on the very thing we're doing, which is, putting data centers in markets that typically have not been peering markets. Uh, what drove that was this explosion of over the top content. Explain this peering market dynamic. Yeah. Uh, you know, was that, is that center on the, the May West, May East? Yeah. If major you, kind of network overlays or autonomous networks? Yeah, correct. That's kind of where if you think about the original peering markets, May East and, or May East and May West, depending on which way you're sitting at the table. And then, in, and then it kind of expanded to six to eight major peering markets. And then, lo and behold, along comes my kids' generation, and, and they start consuming, and these yeah, things, exactly, right? and mobile phones, and they start consuming incredible amounts of, of over-the-top content, especially video content, that just is tremendous amounts of bandwidth being consumed. And what we anticipated and saw was the opportunity to really bring that content to the, to the eyeballs, rather than the eyeballs going and chasing the content. And to do that, I think our dream was and vision was, you needed to build data centers near where the broadband traffic is aggregated in pretty much every market in the US ultimately and bring the over the top content yeah. there, first and foremost, now cloud, and we'll see where it goes from there. So this is a nice natural extension of, a, of expansion strategy. We saw that with head ends with cable. We saw it with cellular, with towers. You guys are doing the same thing where it's, not, it's a new way where you're going to where the demand is. And that's, that is not necessarily mobile, that's just all internet users. That's correct, it's very, you know, um, in real estate it's location, location, location. That's actually how we viewed the data center. When we, when, we, when we thought of this model, we actually thought of a tower model. And we said this is going to be a search ring, only the center of the search ring is actually going to be the primary aggregation router or routers uh, in a market like Nashville or Detroit or Pittsburgh. And what we're going to do is put a data center near there. That may not be the cheapest real estate in all cases, so this isn't a land this isn't a land bank and we build a data center. We're actually going to put a data center where the traffic uh, is being consumed. And then we'll connect directly into whoever the largest broadband provider is in that market, um, make sure that, that that works well for them, and then make sure it works well for the content and now cloud ecosystems. And you know, I, was, I was telling folks earlier, we built the first edge data center in July of 13. There's 23 now, which I think just, you know, the ecosystem spoke loud and clear, and uh, it was one of these, once, once, they, once they got it, once they did it, um, they've been just a wonderful customer base. Uh, and our customers dictate where we go. It's well, kind now, of a great way to now, do it. Now, we cover all the shows with theCUBE. We've done 70 shows last year, VMworld, we just had last week, IBM, HP, Google shows, Facebook events, and one thing that's very clear is that the workloads are driving the new architecture, meaning the apps are driving um, the infrastructure. So you mentioned over the top, right. that spawned up, and that's now it's going to the mobile. So the edge of the network, not only is the data center, it's location, real-time location with devices now, Internet of Things. Self-driving cars. <laughs> yeah. So. yeah, I'm going to put you on my fundraising team. <laughs> <laughs> You've got it. And it's interesting when we I- We take 20%, okay. <laughs> and 2% hey. of all exits. Yeah, gonna you and every other bank. We're going to the department too. <laughs> uh, no, it's, it, you, you hit the nail on the head. It's funny, when, I, when uh, myself and the co-founder, Edmund Wilson, when we thought of this, I tell you we were mobile-centric. We had this grand vision that was all going to move to mobile and, and that's how it was going to play out. Turns out there was a whole lot of consumption on your basic broadband networks, but it's really this year 
it's really this year where we started to see the transition where uh, mobile's catching up, and you're absolutely right. So we started with the over-the-top content, cloud followed, you hit the nail on the head. Internet of things, now you start to look at some interesting announcements like Verizon yeah. doing their uh, their TV over the top and this interesting marriage yeah. of AT&T and, and, and Direct TV. TV yeah. And all of a sudden those, those whole worlds are, are blurred and it's truly, well, another, it's and truly content everywhere. Well, another thing that I'll add to your fundraising deck would be the identity um, systems are merging, right? So you're seeing that you know hybrid cloud has shown that you can run infrastructure anywhere, or apps anywhere, but identity of the user could be driven by the app. That's so great. the identity yeah. login, you go, hey, I'm a Dish subscriber, but I'm here, I'm on HBO Go, I'm on the mobile, I'm in Nashville for a show, I live in Palo Alto. I mean, this is complex tech it that really could be is. simplified by an edge. How do you talk about that? Um, so we do, you know, it's, it, um, I mentioned the over the top, I mentioned cloud, we've talked about some of the other stuff. Uh, just, uh, just in the last week or so, we did a press release with Cloudflare, and you know another great company, uh, rapidly growing company. But it was interesting, the focus of our press release was actually around security. Um, and the need for getting security as far out in the network uh, as you can. Simple, you know, most simple, probably look at a DDoS attack. You want to stop that as far out as you can. You want to put those measures in place. But you just hit the nail on the head, which is, my identity is in my phone right now. Like, me is here, right. and, and the ability to, to, to um, kind of bring my, my version or my cloud with me is, is just the exact type of things we see happening. So we're pretty excited about Talk it. Talk about some of the technologies on the hood. Flash, you're building data centers in real time, so you're looking at the OpEx, CapEx, Piece of it. We Can sure you are. share some best practices in terms of what you guys have done? Obviously, you know you got converged infrastructure. You have flash. You got the big yeah. data opportunity. And two, can you talk about the geography challenges on a state by state basis with respect to data? Okay. Uh, <laughs> Do we have time <laughs> for that? <laughs> no, I think they're gonna they're gonna cut us off. So <laughs> let me uh, let me let me start with some of the best practices on what we did because and and what we learned from others, quite frankly. Uh, when we looked at the, um, you, you asked about the OPEX and CAPEX trade-offs, it's interesting. When we looked at the edge markets, what we realized is you, this is something that needed to think about a different OPEX strategy. Because these data centers didn't necessarily need to be 10, 20, 50, 100 megawatt facilities. In fact, what we had to be able to do was create the same level of economics you might get in that mm -hmm. type of a center, but in a two, three, four megawatt type of facility, because our customers are, well, they're actually really, really smart, <laughs> right? <laughs> the reality is the largest broadband providers and the largest content and cloud providers, they're loaded with smart people, smarter than we are in many ways. So what we saw was a need to, to really change the operational support systems in the data center industry. I came out of telecom 20 years ago, 30 years ago now, I hate to admit it. Uh, uh, I started in the Bell system, and, and it was remarkable when I looked at the data center space how kind of yesterday the operational support systems were. Nobody had actually looked at it and said, if I can run a global telecom network with no people, how come I can't run a network of 20, 50, 60 data centers that are critical nodes on a network in a highly automated, super secure fashion. And 5.9, so you need to have and, high availability. Oh, absolutely, yeah, tier three, um, certainly tier three design spec and yeah. operated. Yeah, that's, you don't get to go. You know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's the price of admission, right? Price of admission. Right? Right? Tel Tel admission. Go down. <laughs> that's right. Um, and so it was interesting, we looked at it, and people just didn't think of that way. A lot of them thought of, it was good systems for an individual center or for individual pieces of a data center, the equipment and so on, but not a holistic view that went from security to data center information management to building management, uh, trouble ticketing, uh, the whole thing. We, I know we've done it right because our customers actually use our system to manage their own workforces inside our centers. That's the ultimate compliment. Um, but we invested a lot in the OSS. So we can actually run these in an automated yeah. fashion. Now that takes some getting used to. You know, if you come from the old world, people are convinced you have to have people there. But we can guarantee response times. You pick the time frame you need. Does your OSS traverse multiple data centers? One, it does. One single unit. pane of glass, 
you as a you as a user, if you were my customer, you'd have a single pane of glass. If you were in all 23 facilities, you'd see into all 23 facilities. You could manage yeah. raising and lowering the loading bay information. You so looking at all the data centers as one system, one resource one system, pool. And all uh, across security, across trouble ticketing, across, okay. you see the, yeah. you actually see all your equipment, you see your temperature, your power consumption in real time, your humidity on every single rack you have in every single facility, everything's tracked with the SLA. So we did that on the OPEX side. That changed the game a lot, <laughs> right there. That let us run a five, you know, call it one to five, two to five megawatt facility as though it were 20, 30, 40, 100 megawatt type uh, facility. Does that shift your focus, allow you to run faster on the build out yeah, and other me, things? Yeah, let's me do wholesale at that level. Let's me right, do so wholesale economics. Lower. Let's me do wholesale economics to sophisticated yeah. customers and do a long term. Sophisticated customers are used to paying yeah, you know, full sure. freight for. That's right. And they're, telling, right. And they're telling you where, you're where to go retail, next. And they're right. telling me where to go next, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and you know something, we're okay with our customer telling us where they so need to So you have a price advantage, because <laughs> you're basically going as low as wholesale, but they're used to paying retail. That's right, that's right. And we're, so it's kind of retail size deployment at, at wholesale, um, Cost, wholesale economics, sure. that's right. Nice. On the CapEx side, the rule of one, my friend. What we did was we, we iterated, we iterated, we iterated. My center one and two, and three are three different designs. Then we stayed the same. <laughs> but what yeah. we did was what so we So you specced it out, you iterated, it, spec it, it got bigger, by the way. Uh, it turns out one, two, and three, we had to grow across the three. We learned that quickly. So one and uh, two will be like the, the history museum. <laughs> Remember right. that one? Yeah, <laughs> you got it, they're a little bigger now. Um, uh, just Punch cards just and, the, uh, no, I'm kidding. The uptake, uh, the uptake, <laughs> yeah, that's not that funny. <laughs> <laughs> you said you were from the Telco 30 years ago. Yeah, and, I had to use, and I had to use punch cards, that's not that funny. Oh, the, uh, uh, but what we did was we, we actually came up with a modular design where, where we could uh, literally kind of start off with a one or two megawatt pod and then expand it um, to, you know, call it three, four, five megawatts, depending on what it is. And what our, we set a hard design goal for us. What we wanted to be able to do was try to build at a KW rate of 50% what the um, what the Uptime Institute said you should be able to build at. You can't do that if everything's customized, right? So we really, we set that out as a design goal. Not there on some, not on all. Uh, you asked about the differences. Yeah. There's actually a difference, right? There are certain states where labor costs more, yeah. where you have to use union labor or not use union labor, and um, you know those drive material cost differences in it. And let's not kid ourselves. Land in some of our markets, like Boston and Miami, that's Expensive. not cheap. Yeah. Uh, land in others of our markets, such as Detroit or Pittsburgh, are more affordable. And so there are definitely yeah. variables in there. The challenge for us was could we largely provide a, within call it 10%, consistent pricing mechanism across all that. So I want to ask you about, just in compare and contrast, a little history lesson into where we are today. So totally get the model, but let's go back to the um, uh, web, internet. AOL was just a small little startup, UUNet, all these exchange points, they dial up with the, you know, phone lines, um, and then those were concentrated infrastructure points that kind of dictated kind of how things were done and was not that very innovative. And then things start to expand. And then like Yahoo and the web, web came, and then Akamai created this overlay. Right. Is this similar concept from a data center standpoint? You guys building kind of a, is it an overlay network? Is it well, pure network, peering network? How do you yeah. describe that? And, and what does that give you as an advantage from a, uh, from a customer standpoint? What do they get from you that's the equivalent? And Akamai was clear. You can go to the edge and your images load fast based yeah. on the dial up. So, so a, a customer of ours is Akamai, right? We, it's an extremely valuable customer of ours. And what we've tried to do for Akamai is say, Hey, let's let's try to give you a I don't know if it's an overlay or an underlay, but let's try to provide a set of infrastructure in a whole bunch of markets that heretofore didn't necessarily have that peering infrastructure. So we tried to build that a maybe it's a fill-in, a densification is probably the best way to describe like it. It's a densification of infrastructure across the entire US so that now my, your, your Akamai or Limelight or yeah. Fastly or Cloudflare or name your favorite or. They can't scale, they right, need you to or scale. Google or we hope Densification. And, it's, and so what we are is providing an densification <laughs> of Densification that. go with the API-ification <laughs> of, <laughs> of the world. The dense, <laughs> making it more dense as in not more silly. Just to, uh, like to watch uh, more to, movies. To, uh, 
Yeah, so you can watch more movies. <laughs> right. So you can get at more cloud services, a lot of what and we're talking about And do more Snapchats today. and, and <laughs> yeah. all this good stuff. Uh, yeah, that's exactly what's going on. And so that's what we've done. We've tried to provide the infrastructure you might see in Ashburn, Virginia, or in, in Santa Clara, uh, California. We've tried to... So what's next for you guys? How do you fit into console? Because obviously you are now becoming essentially a, po a point of presence yeah. in these local markets. Yeah, I, I, we think console's a great idea. We, you know, we think uh, uh, in many ways, I'll use my, my example in Detroit or in Nashville, um, if we can get our console, if console uh, in us as we continue to expand our relationship, uh, they place a, a console node in our facility in Nashville. Now all your enterprises in Nashville have a wonderful on-ramp to the console ecosystem, some of which is the same as ours, some of which expands our ecosystem. So I now have a great on-ramp to go. I can be a Nashville business getting on the console on-ramp here in Nashville, going to Ashburn, uh, picking up my cloud services in a very direct, secure, highest quality connection possible. Yeah, mission so, critical, just extend out the okay. connection to the and edge. And now what we've done is kind of make an on-ramp in every market. That's awesome. Uh, final word, I wanted to get you the, uh, your point of view. Share with the folks here watching live and on demand who didn't make the event. What's going on here at Console Connect Live? What's the vibe? Who's here? What are they missing? What's going on? Give a quick summary. I, I think the vibe is a, a little bit of wow. It's it's uh, that next generation of software defined connection is here. I don't think it's, I don't even think folks had thought about it in some ways. I think we got infatuated with SDN and NFB and some of that, but there's an element of it here in software defined connection. And I think there's a sense of it's real. I, I think that's the real vibe I get. I think the other big thing we're hearing today is the ecosystems that are starting to circle around and starting to really get excited about it. I'm seeing big key anchors to lots of ecosystems um, sitting at the sitting at the table today, and that's so exciting. So one of the things I want to just, Mark Andreessen just retweeted one of my comments I mentioned earlier about 10X developer, I was referencing to one of his comments. He said, in DevOps, in the development world, with cloud, one developer's like 10 developers in the old days. Network engine, we coined the term here in the queue this morning, 10X network engineers. Right. There's not enough guys out there to make your market. So what, I, what we see is this console connect, a 10X network engineer, they're making your market for you. They're That's essentially right. saying, hey, you don't need to be a network total geek. You can be sufficient enough with pushing a button, knowing how networks and provisioning basic stuff. Right. And you they're up be, and running. You can be competent in IT and be a network engineer in many ways. And 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 be able to do some of the things, you know, that, that before heretofore you might have to hire an expert network engineer. And good luck with that too, right? I mean, just not enough people Amen. in the world. <laughs> there right? are. So, I mean, you know, there right? aren't. How do you know if it's good or bad? <laughs> How many Bill Nortons are there out there? How many Paul Games are there out there? Not many. There's only one Bill Norton. <laughs> I just want to stop your We know that. <laughs> Daniel, thanks so much for sharing your insights. We're a little long there, but great content. Congratulations, and how old's the company, and what's next? The uh, company was founded in the middle of 2010. Uh, and what's next? We're actually uh, this year moving outside the U.S. We have uh, we'll be moving uh, internationally this year. So hopefully, when we do this next year, we'll be talking about the first ten or eleven markets outside the U.S. Well, we'd love to find out Excellent. what events you're going to. Get you on the cube and hear about your global consumption contract with customers <laughs> and how that's going, <laughs> especially with your data in multiple <laughs> countries and all these jurisdictions. <laughs> that's a whole other cube segment. In yes, itself. it is. Uh, we're here inside the cube, sharing some insight with you with sharing the data. We'll be right back with more live in San Francisco. Let's go after the short break.